It's a great pleasure to have uh, Bamdad Hosseini as our speaker today for the CRM Applied Math Seminar. Bamdad got his PhD in Applied and Computational Mathematics at Simon Fraser University under the supervision of professors Nidhi Manigam and John Stockey. And he was also winner of the SIAM student, Best Student Paper Prize back in 2017 when he was a PhD student. Now he's a postdoc and a von Karman instructor at Caltech and, and is working under the supervision of Professor Andrew Stewart. So his research spans the areas of Bayesian inverse problems, mathematics of machine learning and industrial mathematics. So today, Banda will talk about data-driven supervised learning and a topic at the intersection between a really uh, hot area of neural networks and another hot area in computational mathematics, which is uncertainty quantification. So, Bamdad, take it all away. Thanks again for being with us today. Yeah, thanks Simone for the invitation and thanks everybody for being here today for my talk. Um, yeah, so I just, before starting, I wanted to say like, if you guys have any questions, just please uh, put them in chat and then I guess Simone can interrupt me and, and ask uh, right there because I don't have too many slides. So I think we'll have a lot of time to sort of discuss just as I'm going through the talk. Um, yeah, so as Simone said, like uh, my title is, is a bit of like a mishmash of, of like um, buzzwords, uh, but really the main topic, the main sort of focus is data driven sort of learning, which um, if you're coming in from the machine learning sort of uh, community, these are very hot areas. The idea is basically that you want to uh, learn something about a system. Uh, without really having to model things too much. So you just want to use data to sort of um, learn the behavior of, of a certain system. Okay, so that's very vague, but, but hopefully by the end of the talk, it uh, becomes more clear. Um, okay, uh, so for today's talk, I'm going to present uh, essentially two of our recent papers. So it's the, this first paper with our with uh, Kaushik, uh, Nikola Kovacki, and Andrew Stewart, um, uh, where we sort of use neural networks for uh, model regression for PDE models. And the second paper is, is a collaboration also with Nikola Kovacki and Ricardo Batista. Um, so Nick is a PhD student at Caltech, Ricardo is a PhD student at MIT. And uh, Yusuf Marzouk is, is a professor at MIT as well. And uh, this talk sort of takes, uh, this, this paper takes a different view towards supervised learning and it's more sort of taking a probabilistic view. Um, I also wanted to plug some of my collaborators' works that I'm not actually a co-author on, but they're very closely related uh, to the work that I'm showing here. And a lot of the people you see on these other two papers are actually in our group here at Caltech. So I just wanted to, you know, plug their papers as well. Okay, so a brief sort of outline of my talk. Uh, I'll start by basically giving you the main ideas of the talk in, in the first uh, bit. So I'll, I'll give the main ideas first. And then in the next two parts, I will go over the, essentially the, the results from those two papers. So in the second part, I'll talk about model emulation with neural networks. And in the third part, I'll talk about uh, conditional sampling um, using generative adversarial networks. Um, okay, so let's start with a summary of the talk. Um, so uh, the first bit is going to be sort of combining supervised learning and model emulation. So supervised learning is something that we know from machine learning. Model emulation is something that is sort of developed more in statistics and UQ, okay? So what is a general sort of supervised learning framework? Uh, so you have some uh, input space X and uh, some output space Y. And this output space, I guess if you're doing regression is just like RD. And if you're doing classification, it's like one of K classes, right? And then you have some data, which is say your training data. And uh, that's just pairs of points X and Y. Um, and your goal really is to uh, find the output y at a new point at a new input x star. 
right? So that's essentially sort of roughly speaking the goal of um, supervised learning, okay? Um, so there's a deterministic mapping perspective for this, which is the following, and, and I know I'm, I'm sort of oversimplifying things, but, but this is just for the purposes of the talk for now. Um, so the deterministic mapping perspective is that you assume there is some ground truth map psi dagger from X to Y, the, the input to output space, such that um, the output at X star at any new input is given a psi dagger of X star, okay? And then what you do in supervised learning is you will take an approximation class F, so these can be certain maps that are nonlinear, they can have like smoothness properties, and then your new goal is to find some function psi star in this approximation class that is the closest to psi dagger, the true sort of ground truth input to output mapping. Okay, so that's what essentially classic supervised learning is. All right. So let's now think about model emulation again from that's that's mostly done sort of in engineering and UQ. So here the idea is that it's very similar to supervised learning. That's sort of the point I'm making here. So you have input output spaces that in this case are Bonnock spaces because you typically have PD um, sort of models there. So you have a complicated, expensive, high dimensional input output map. So this side dagger is sort of too costly for you to evaluate. And then your goal is to sort of find an efficient or cheap approximation psi star to this psi dagger. And this is essentially, again, I'm oversimplifying, uh, but this is essentially what things like Gaussian process emulators, polynomial chaos, reduced basis methods, these types of, types of methods do, is that they, they have some training data. Um, of course, there's a lot of thought that goes into how to pick the training data here. But then again, you have an approximation class F, and then you choose psi star to be the sort of closest approximation to psi dagger um, within your approximation class, all right? So if you view these two problems from, from the perspective I just presented, then you can see that they're very sort of similar to each other, right? Um, so part of what we do here is to try to sort of bring these two communities together and basically use some of the tools that are developed in the machine learning side in the model emulation side. So um, trying to use the benefit of sort of neural networks for model emulation. So as a summary of what I will present later in the talk, so the idea that, that, that we have here is that you um, want to emulate a model, but you don't want to emulate the model on the entire input space, which is typically what you would do, say, for Gaussian processes. Instead, you sort of take a probability measure mu on your input, and you want to approximate the um, mapping psi dagger on the support of this measure mu, okay? So say you have a PDE model, you want to approximate the solution um, for certain types of inputs that, for example, have some smoothness class, all right? So what we do here is uh, we sort of use a combination of neural networks with uh, encoders and decoders. So we have a PCA, encoder and decoder. So F will take you from a function space to finite dimensions. And then G is a decoder that takes you from finite dimensions to a function space, which is the output. And then we have a neural network S, which will sit in the middle of the encoder and the decoder. So you compose your PCA encoder with S and then G, okay? And the, the idea is that now if you train the neural network and, and you can sort of approximate the PCA encoder decoder, then you should be able to approximate the mapping psi dagger. So the way you do this is by solving this kind of an optimization problem, which you would do in the, I, I call it the perfect setting, meaning that I have infinite amounts of data. Of course, you cannot do that. So you do the data-driven approximation, which is that you have replaced the expectation in that functional with an empirical sum. And then now, as I will show you in, in, in a little bit, this whole framework can be done in a data-driven fashion in that um, I just need a bunch of 
sample inputs and outputs in order to train this whole thing. Okay. So this would be the sort of part two of the talk, what I will talk about. And then um, in the next one, which is sort of taking a different perspective from to, towards supervised learning is now taking supervised learning and instead of model emulation, we think of it as a conditional uh, sampling uh, problem. So here it's a, here's a different perspective towards supervised learning. So you have your input and output spaces and you can associate a joint probability measure to your data, right? So you have input and output and there's some, you know, um, joint probability measure on the input output space from which your training data is, is coming from. And then what you want is more than just pretend, uh, predicting y at a new input x star, what you want now is to identify a conditional probability measure um, of y conditioned on the input x star. Okay, so this is more like a UQ perspective here because you want to be able to do some sort of uncertainty quantification with this conditional measure. Okay, so again, how does classic supervised learning fit here? Remember, we had this deterministic type mapping. Um, I mean, you, you basically assume in classic supervised learning there's some map psi dagger that can even, I mean, you can model it as a stochastic mapping as well. So I have some randomness in it. And then you're assuming, so this is the important step, that um, the joint measure for your data is, is sort of this, has this a specific form that X is coming from a marginal that is independent of Y and then Y is given a psi dagger of X. All right, so this is a model that you put on your data in classic supervised learning. And then your new goal is to, again, approximate this map psi dagger. And then once you approximate it, you can just put the conditional to be the law of psi dagger of x star. That's sort of how you can formulate classic supervised learning in this per perspective of conditional probability. But then the viewpoint that we take is a little different from this. And we use measure transport. So. The idea is that we don't want to employ this model that there is some psi dagger that if I knew it, I could identify the conditional measure. Instead, what we want to do is, is we want to target the conditional measure. Um, and then we have a reference measure eta, which is independent of X. So for all intents and purposes, this is just a Gaussian, like a uh, IID Gaussian measure, okay? And then your goal now is instead of finding that map psi dagger is to find a transport map S star that goes from X cross Y to Y. And then if I evaluate this transport map at X star and I push Ada through this mapping evaluated at X star, I get the conditional that I want, okay? So this is now a completely different perspective, if you like, from what I showed in the previous slide. All right. So how do you actually go about doing this? Turns out there's actually a very efficient sort of way you can do it. Um, and we, we sort of one way you can, that, that we uh, propose in our work is to modify these generative adversarial networks. Uh, as I will show you in a little bit, you don't really need to use the GANs. We just found that they work quite well, okay? So the idea really is, is the following. So you um, have, whoops. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So you have your input and output, which I will consider they're finite dimensional. And um, you take your ADA to be the joint distribution on X and Y to be just the Gaussian. And then you define a block triangular map T. Okay, so this map T is block triangular because essentially if you think of it as a matrix, it will be a triangular matrix, right? But then if X and Y are, are um, uh, vectors, then this thing will be a block triangular matrix, although it's a nonlinear mapping. So it has a specific form. You have some mapping K and then you have S of K of X and Y and so on. That doesn't matter so much right now, but the point is really that you choose this form of the mapping T, you draw some training data from the joint measure on X and Y, 
There is no model assumption on a psi dagger existing here. And then you also draw some samples from this reference measure that you also put on the input output space. So these, these X tilde, Y tildes are just IID Gaussian draws here. And then you solve this optimization problem down here, which looks a bit complicated, but this, I mean, if you've worked with the GANs, this is just a GAN functional. The only thing we add is a monotonicity constraint. Okay, and I'll show you what the details of this are. And the trick really is that once you add this monotonicity constraint, you get invertibility for the map T and in turn the map S. And what that gives you is a very nice and simple formula for uh, conditioning, which is that this map S um, that you get out of solving this optimization problem is exactly what you need to condition, uh, to obtain the conditional of, of new um, dy on x star, okay? All right, so that's essentially the whole talk um, very quickly in a few slides, but uh, now let me uh, move on into details because uh, I'm sure that's, that's kind of confusing. Um, just a quick note on the neural networks, just um, in case you're not familiar with them. Um, I don't want to get into the neural networks themselves that much because um, this talk I think is not really about neural networks uh, because we just use them as tools here. Uh, but just to give you an idea, it's, you know, you've seen these pictures probably a lot that, that there are these sort of graphical models. We sort of take the functional perspective. Um, so a neural network is essentially some function S defined in the following way. So you have an input Z, you multiply it by a matrix that can maybe increase or decrease your dimension. Then you do something that resembles time stepping uh, there's a nonlinearity here by some function sigma, which you can take it to be the ReLU function or the um, ELU function. And uh, so you do some time stepping essentially with some nonlinearity. And then um, at the output, again, you have a linear transformation that brings you back to the right dimension essentially, okay? And there are a lot of reasons. I mean, there's a lot of work being done these days about why these sort of function approximations are good for high dimensional um, approximation and, and empirically they've shown some great results. Okay. All right, so let me now move on to the model emulation uh, work that we talked about briefly. Okay, so um, the way we sort of think about our approximation method here is, is with this commutative diagram. Um, so the map that you want to approximate is this map psi dagger going from X to Y. And um, that's kind of difficult to approximate, of course. You should think of it as like a PDE map of, of, of the solution map of a PDE. And uh, so what you do is you do essentially a dimension reduction here, going to finite dimensions, and then you apply a nonlinear map um, between two finite dimensional spaces. And then you have another map that is the decoder that brings you back up to a function space, okay? So what you want is this sort of indirect path that I drew to approximate psi dagger essentially. Uh, so the assumptions we have here, um, I'm gonna present the simpler version. We have sort of more general um, assumptions in the paper. So we want psi dagger to be globally Lipschitz. You can relax that to locally Lipschitz. And you also want, um, there's this probability measure mu that, that you assume, you know, you want to approximate the mapping on its support and you want this to have at least four moments. We need that for defining the PCA um, projections. And you can strengthen this. I, I mean, if you want to relax the local Lipschitz nets, you need to strengthen that condition. But essentially anything that has finitely many moments should be fine, okay? All right, so then our first task is to define the PCA encoders and decoders. So that, those would be the FX, GX, FY, and GY functions. They're defined in the same way uh, for both the input and output spaces, okay? Uh, so you define the mean and covariance operators. So the mean on X is the expected value with respect to mu, covariance the same way. And on the output space, you want the push forward of mu with respect to psi dagger, 
So presumably you can approximate these expectations because you, you, you have a way of, of evaluating psi dagger. So think about like a very detailed, expensive, finite element solver for a PDE. You can evaluate it, but maybe not that many times, okay? So you have a way of approximating these covariance operators. Um, and then given these covariance operators, you define I, uh, the following eigenvalue problems. Uh, so everything that has X on it is on the input. Everything that has Y on it is on the output. So you solve these eigenvalue problems. These would be, I mean, if your measures were Gaussian, they would be the Calhoun and Loeb modes. And then you define your encoders and code decoders as follows. So the decoders are mappings that take a new point in your function space and they return the basis coefficients on the PCA uh, eigenfunctions. And the decoders take a sequence of numbers and they um, basically use them as coefficients on the, P on the PCA um, eigenfunctions padded by zero. All right, so that's, that's the, sort of the simplest encoder and decoder that you can think of, I guess. All right, so that tells us what the F and G maps are. And then we define this map psi dagger in the middle as follows. So this is now a mapping that is essentially given by, um, so you apply, uh, I guess up here, you apply g of x first. So you go from finite dimensions back to the function space with the decoder. Um, then you apply psi dagger, and then you apply the encoder again to come back to finite dimensions. All right. And the trick that you play here is really that you now want to approximate um, this phi dagger mapping that I just defined with a neural network. So S will be our neural network through the talk. So you just put, you want to approximate S, uh, sorry, phi dagger with S. And once you do that approximation, you define your emulator to be the following. So now you, again, you decode with F of X, then you put S here, and then you encode with G of Y and go back up to Y. All right. So already I've introduced sort of at least two layers of approximation here. Okay, so first thing you might sort of wonder and, and want to sort of prove um, is, does this even make sense? So am I guaranteed? Because, you know, I'm, I'm using the PCA encoder and decoder, then there's this phi dagger that I defined that is kind of strange. Um, and then I'm approximating that with a neural network. So it's important to know is all of this at least theoretically going to work. So we have an existence result for this, which is the following. So you can pick any epsilon bigger than zero. And then um, for that epsilon, there are PCA dimensions. So this dx and dy, you should think of them as how many PCA modes should I keep. keep. Um, so they will depend on uh, the epsilon that you chose. And then there's a requisite amount of data. So this is the size of the training set that will in turn depend on the PCA dimensions that you picked. And it will actually increase with the PCA dimensions that you pick. And then we can show there is a zero extended neural network S that will also its number of, of its depth and width will depend on your epsilon, dx, and dy. And uh, for that neural network, so you can show that this sort of error is going to be controlled by epsilon, okay? Uh, so the zero extended neural network, I, I mean, I didn't really define what this is, but it's, I wouldn't, I mean, you don't need to worry about it. It's essentially because neural networks are often defined on compact sets. So we kind of have to truncate the domain um, to make it compact. And then you're, you're gonna incur some error in doing that. Um, but you can still control it and keep it as of order epsilon, okay? Uh, so essentially what this bound says is you can control the variance of, of the error incurred by psi star using psi star instead of psi dagger. Okay. Um, so the important thing though to keep in mind is that the, the training data you need for this whole process is the following. So you draw a bunch of XJs from mu and then you evaluate psi dagger of XJ. All right. And that's all the data you need. So you define the PCA modes and the neural network, everything, the whole training process is done uh, 
uh, with this training data. And the method we use for proving this theorem is essentially uh, a results of Yorotsky, uh, which shows existence of sort of deep neural networks with some bounds on their depth and width. And then uh, there's a, another result by Blanchard et al. That, that we used for controlling the PCA errors. Um, I should also note that this is just an existence result, which is, again, if you're familiar with the neural network uh, theory, it seems to be sort of uh, the most common type of results in that field that you, you show that there exists a network of a certain size that, that gets within the error that, that you like but it's very hard to prove that the networks that we use in practice are actually the ones that show up in these proofs because they're sort of constructive proofs. All right, but we have some theory that says this framework actually works. So let me show you some numerical exam experiments. So here's the Darcy flow uh, PDE. So we have a domain omega in R2, which here is the unit box, and you have an elliptic PDE uh, where uh, you have a, a coefficient A, it's your permeability field, and the solution is U, um, and then you have source term F and, and G is the boundary term. So typically, I guess in, in model emulation, you have three operators here that you worry about. There's the mapping from the boundary data to the solution and the mapping from the source term to the solution. Uh, I won't talk about these two here because they're linear maps and, and you can, you know, if your input measure mu is Gaussian, you can actually approximate them quite well. I want to focus more on the, on the harder problem, which is the mapping from the permeability field A to uh, the solution U, okay? Uh, also note that I'm changing my notation here. So instead of using X and Y as input, I'm using A and U because these are standard notations in PDE theory. Um, but yeah, so your input is A, output is U, and now you want to approximate the mapping from A to U. And um, we are going to sort of look at a specific setting where your input A takes forms like this picture. So it's a piecewise constant field, um, which is either 12 or three, and then the, but the shape of the support of the area where it's 12 or three is, is changing. But the solution is also always very nice and smooth, of course, because it's an elliptic PD. Okay. So uh, we define mu as a thresholded Gaussian field. So you take a Gaussian field, and then wherever it's positive, you put it equal to 12. Wherever it's negative, you put it equal to 3. That's how we draw samples from mu. So we draw 1,024 training samples, and then we compute the solutions for those permeability fields. We do this with a finite element uh, code. And then using those samples, so now we have AJs and UJs, so we compute PCA projections G and F, the usual way that you do PCA. So this is essentially doing SVD in, in say MATLAB. Then we define a neural network with the following uh, architecture. Um, the details don't really matter too much. Uh, these numbers, 500, 1,000, 2,000, and so on, are the number of free parameters in each layer of the network. And then we optimize um, the, the neural network by minimizing this loss function, all right? So G and F are now data dependent and, and they're the PCA mode, the PCA projections, and then the neural network is in the middle, and we minimize this kind of a cost function, right? And then for the testing, we will uh, draw 5,000 samples again from mu and then solve using the finite element code, and um, we sort of compare the output of our, approxim of our emulator with the finite element code. So here are some of the, the results that, that kind of show you how good or, or alternatively how bad the method is. Um, so here's a sample draw from mu. Here's psi dagger, here's psi star, and the error between psi dagger and psi star. You can kind of visually see that on the top of this yellow blob, there's more error, and that's, that's also what you see in the error plot. Um, but if you compare the method sort of to other approaches, so uh, here we compare it to a linear approximation where you replace 
uh, S with a linear mapping. So instead of the neural network, you just have a linear map. And also with the reduced basis method. So what you see is we're doing, our neural network does better than the linear map, but it's not as good as the reduced basis method. Um, however, you should keep in mind that the reduced basis method is a intrusive method in that it requires knowledge of your parametrization of A and the PD and everything. Our method just relies on just solution samples. So it's completely blind uh, to, to your uh, PD and also your parametrization of A. Another thing you'll notice if you're a numerical analyst is that this error is going up as I increase the, the PCA dimensions. Um, and that's worrisome, but then the theory tells us that as you increase the PCA dimension, you should increase the size of the um, training set. So if you do that, then the error starts to flat out. So as you increase the dimension, you increase n the number of training data, and you can see the error is, remains controlled here. Yeah. So this part of the, the numerics is actually in line with the theory. Uh, another interesting feature of this method, which miss, is, is sort of missing from some of the other work in this direction that tries to sort of learn uh, PDE solutions using, using neural networks, um, is that our method is more or less mesh independent in the following sense. So you can generate your training data on one mesh and your test data on a different mesh. And then you can take the two solutions um, and then you can interpolate or extend between the two meshes and the errors are remain controlled in the following sense. So the plot I'm showing here, the red line is the case where you've trained using a fine mesh and the blue line is, is when you've trained using a coarse mesh and then you're testing on, on the resolution here is the resolution of the test mesh. So what you see is if you train on a fine mesh, then your error remains controlled for coarser meshes and small perturbations of your fine mesh. But if you train on a coarse mesh, your error grows, which means that we don't have any kind of super resolution, uh, but at least we are sort of robust to perturbations of the mesh, which is not surprising because mesh perturbation, you can kind of approximate it as just perturbing the PCA projections a little bit. All right, so let me summarize before moving on to the, the next part of the talk. So um, we have a mesh-free, well, mesh-free in, in sort of a weak sense, right? Um, and model agnostic emulation method on Hilbert spaces, it's model agnostic because it doesn't require knowledge of the PDE. Uh, we use PCA encoders and decoders to map to finite dimensional latent spaces. Uh, by the way, the choice of PCA is not crucial. You can use autoencoders or variational autoencoders or fancier methods if you like. PCA is nice because it's simple and also you can analyze. It's very hard to analyze other sort of nonlinear encoders. Um, and then we use a neural network approximation to map between the latent spaces, which are now finite dimensional. Oh, I see. It's called event space, yeah. Three, that goes to the stem. So each stem doesn't have enough space to grow. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Could you repeat it? Hello? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna... mistake, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can, I can come back and answer at the end. Maybe they can ask the question or put it in chat maybe. Okay, I'll just continue. Um, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so so the point again I wanna highlight is, is that using the neural network between the latent spaces is you're just using it as a, as a tool. So if you have a better high dimensional approximation method, by all means you can use it within this framework. Um, and then there are, of course, there are a lot of future directions you can take this. Uh, the most important for me, again, thinking of this from the numerical analysis perspective is stability analysis for the neural nets, which is missing for the most part in the literature and also um, solving inverse problems. So we typically like from in UQ, we would like to uh, take these model emulators and then put them into inverse problems as a forward map and then do MCMC or something like that. Uh, so we have yet to try and see how good these emulators are. And then thirdly, this sort of a big deal in, in machine learning is trying to have 
physical constraints on your emulator to make sure that your emulator respects certain things like conservation laws. And there's a lot of exciting work being done in this direction these days, but we haven't really thought about that yet. All right. Okay, so that's it about the model emulation uh, part of the talk. Uh, I think I have like 20 minutes left. So um, I can maybe, if there are any questions about this part of the talk, I can take them now quickly before moving on to conditional sampling. Um, I have one question. Sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, so maybe it's not a great question because it's a bit late here for me. But uh, if you go to page 16, uh, 17, uh, when you kind of define like your theorem and then like you apply it. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, can you possibly skip to the next page too? Yes. Okay, cool, yeah, so I guess, yes, forgive me if it's a bad question because you can see it's not a thing. Um, but yeah, so you're approximately a PD, right? Or the solution mm -hmm. operator of PD, right? Uh, yep. Your theorem guarantees, uh, it's a guarantee in L2 from what I saw very quickly, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, does this matter? Because uh, shouldn't the approximation be at least in a sublow space or possible in the C2, a CK space, you know, of sufficient order K? Uh, so do you mean about the cost function I use for, for, my, um, for my training? No. Or I guess the or... theoretical guarantee on page 16, it's convergence yeah. in L2. Would that matter? I don't know, maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, it does, it does actually. So you're raising a good point that, that I forgot to mention is that this PDE example actually doesn't fit exactly within the theoretical framework um, because, um, I mean, well, the, the output space H1 is, is, I guess, you know, it's that, that guy is a Hilbert space, right? So you can just put an H1 norm on that. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and but then what we do in the training, if you actually, um, look at this slide is we're using L2. We just found that L2 and H1 don't, don't really matter. Okay. 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 Plus There's I guess still, you're right. If they're, if they're yeah. both separable Hilbert spaces and they're isometric, so maybe it doesn't matter yeah. so much. True. So it's fine. But then what's the problem is that this mapping is not Lipschitz between these two spaces. And also yeah. our X space is not a Hilbert space, but then we use an embedding. Yeah, yeah. This, this I noticed. I don't want to say, yeah, cool. So there's some some stuff I'm sweeping under the rug. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Sorry for bringing it up out of, out of the rug. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, are there other questions before I move on? Okay. All right. So so let me now change gears and now move on to the conditional sampling perspective. Um, so this is going to sort of change things quite a bit now. Um, so. As I talked about sort of in the, in the beginning of, uh, in the introductory part of the talk, the idea here is that you want to think of conditional as supervised learning as, as conditional or conditioning in, in of probability measures. And the particular approach that we want to employ here is, is a measure transport approach. So the thinking is the following. So you have some target measure so this would be, you know, something, this is, imagine this is what your joint measure on X and Y looks like. It's kind of twisted and maybe complicated. And you want to condition this, this measure. So you want to essentially slice it and then you want to identify this slice. And this is a hard problem because, you know, you don't know much about this measure. Presumably in practice, you only have samples from this measure. But then on the other hand, you can pick a reference measure like a Gaussian that I have at the bottom and then conditioning for this measure is easy, right? Um, so the thinking here sort of in the, in the approach I will show you is that you can find a transport map that takes you from the reference eta to nu. And if you sort of do this transport correctly, then from this map T, you can extract another map S that can allow you to transport the conditionals of eta to the conditionals of nu that you're actually looking for, okay? And the trick really is in this way that you formulate uh, the, the sort of shape of T, right? So T has a first coordinate that only depends on X. It's a nonlinear transformation. And then the second component is S of K of X and Y, okay? And everything here I'm going to restrict to 
finite dimensions, we have yet to sort of um, define these on Hilbert spaces, although I, I think it's possible, but it's kind of different from the last part of the talk that everything was on Hilbert spaces. Okay. Um, so why would you want to go through all of this trouble? This seems like sort of a lot more complicated than the way we usually do supervised learning. So there are sort of two reasons for this. One is that uh, we like probabilistic supervised learning because it allows us to do uncertainty quantification. So it can, instead of just getting one output condition on X, you can get statistics, you can get mean, median, confidence in intervals. Um, so there's a lot more information there. And secondly, um, the framework that I will show you is again a model agnostic method, or if you're coming from statistics, it's essentially likelihood free inference in the sense that the only thing that you will need to construct your maps T and S are um, knowledge of the joint measures nu and eta, and also of the conditionals of eta, which as I said, you can just take eta to be, because it's arbitrary reference measure, you can take it to be Gaussian. So these conditionals are just Gaussians as well. And the, the approach doesn't really have any specific, so explicit underlying model assumptions on your data. So first, let me show you some results to convince you that all of these, this sort of laundry list that, that seems maybe too good to be true is it, you can actually do it and it's, it can work out very nicely. So here are three sort of models for data. Um, so I have uh, the first model, I have sort of X is real, value. it's drawn say from a Gaussian. And then the output is tanch of X plus gamma where gamma is the noise, it's a gamma noise. Um, in the third, in the second one, I have a nonlinear function of X plus noise. So the noise appears in the nonlinearity. Third one, the noise is multiplicative, multiplicative with the nonlinearity, okay? So these are three different models. If you normally want to do regression with these things, you need to sort of make assumptions about how the noise is entering all of this and what type of noise it is to set up your likelihood correctly. But then what I'm showing you at the bottom are the first column are the true joint measures of X and Y. Second column is what our method is approximating, which visually is pretty close. Second column is showing you the mean and the uh, confidence intervals on Y conditioned on X star. Uh, the red lines are the approximations and the blues are the true uh, mean and confidence intervals, which are kind of matching quite well. And the third column is the solid lines are the conditional PDFs and the bars are the histograms coming from our model for sampling the conditional, all right? So I haven't told you what it is yet, but um, th these pictures show you that you can actually, um, without really knowing what the model for the data is, you can do these kinds of inference problems, okay? So, um, how do we actually go about doing this? So let me now go through the details. Um, so the trick, sort of the, the, the how of, of doing this whole block triangular measure transport is that theoretically you can actually show that such transportation transport maps exist under very general conditions. Um, you pretty much need new and eta to have no atoms and be absolutely continuous. Um, you can construct these mappings explicitly. So if you are familiar with the North Rosenblatt rearrangement, it's one of the examples in optimal transport like Villani's book or Sant'Ambrogio, they have it uh, in, their, in the books. Uh, you can actually construct it explicitly for given measures nu and eta. And, but we don't want to do this explicit construction. We employ again an optimization approach where we basically minimize the distance between the push forward of the reference and the target measure, the target joint measure nu. So I put the dx dy's here to stress that everything is being solved on the, on the product space, on the joint measures. And this d, I mean, it's pretty general at this point. d is anything that you can roughly call a statistical divergence. So it's basically zero if and only if the measures are the same. All right, it can be anything you want. And um, this map, this class T, T calligraphic T, sorry, uh, 
this would be any appropriate class of mappings that, that is sort of general enough essentially to contain the North Rosenblatt rearrangement here. Okay, so then you have yet again a theory that is sort of in a very perfect sort of idealized setting, which is that if you have this optimization problem and T star is any global minimizer, so global minimizers have to achieve a zero distance up there, um, and T takes this form that we've been working with. So you have K star and S star of K star of X and Y, and T is surjective. Then for any X star in the support of, of um, uh, the marginal on the input, it holds that S star of X star pushing eta will be equal to the conditional that you want, all right? And the problem, of course, here is, okay, so how do you want to guarantee surjectivity of T? So here's where we employ some of the classic results from functional, nonlinear functional analysis. Do we use the browdy minty theorem that tells you if you have continuity, monotonicity, and coercivity, then you have surjectivity. And coercivity turns out in this case to be not so important because you typically have data that is sort of supported almost on a compact set. Um, monotonicity seems to be the most important um, thing here. Continuity you can achieve by just the way you parameterize your map T. Um, and sort of this is the place where now you, the question would be, okay, how do you want to parameterize T and it, which is essentially how do you want to parameterize S and K because they're separate maps. Uh, so this is the place where we thought of using generative adversarial networks because they're essentially designed and optimized in many ways for mapping probability measures, although they're not designed for conditioning. So one way to view what, what we're doing here is really as a modification of the GAN framework to be able to do um, conditioning. So you've probably seen pictures like this in if you've seen uh, papers on GANs that these are like randomly generated pictures of birds that look like they're actual birds, but then when you pay a little bit of attention, they're not, they're kind of weird. Um, and really the way we think about the GANs is that they're, they're a transformation of probability measures. So the way you generate these pictures is that you have a reference, which is also typically Gaussian. You draw from that Gaussian, you push the draws through a neural network, and then you end up with a sample from your target density, which might be something as complicated as images of birds. Okay. Um, so what we do is we, because the GANs are so successful, we take our cost function here, the statistical quote unquote divergence to be the GAN functional, which is the supremum of, of this sort of sum of two expectations. And um, if you're familiar with optimal transport, this is not very surprising because this is essentially, it, it very much resembles the duality results that we know from optimal transport that the Wasserstein distance between two measures you can is equal to the supremum over the difference of expectations with some function f and, and it's you know convex conjugate um, under the, the other measure, right? So this sort of log of one minus f of t would be would play the role of that convex conjugate. And what we do also is for this class of mappings t, we choose um, continuous and strictly monotone block triangular map. So we add this um, almost everywhere monotonicity constraint on top of our continuity assumption, okay? And now the next step is just approximation, right? So we have a bunch of mappings that are continuous. We will replace them with neural networks. And then this cost function, we will also approximate by using empirical sums and also replacing F with a certain neural network as well. So that's what essentially gives you the, the training uh, recipe. So you have training data, which is just samples from input and output. You, you generate a bunch of free sort of samples from ADA. These are free because ADA, we take it to be a Gaussian. Um, then you replace K, S, and F, and S I highlighted because it's the one you really care about. You replace them with neural networks, and then you approximate the GAN functional with with 
uh, empirical sums and you impose average monotonicity. So we don't impose monotonicity almost everywhere. We just do it on average using some of the samples we drew from ADA. And this in practice seems to be enough to actually ensure that your, the map T that you end up with is for the most part monotone. And it makes the computations really, really fast. So just to show you that the, con that the monotonicity is important, here's a simple example mapping a unit Gaussian to a uniform between negative three and three. The blue line here is the map you get from the GANs, which don't have monotonicity constraint. constraint. Clearly the map is not surjective. Uh, but when you do our monotone GANs with the monotonicity just imposed on average, you get this red line which matches perfectly the North Rosenblatt rearrangement as well. And at least on the support here, it's, it's an invertible map. And by the way, for both of the GAN and the MGAN, if you look at the samples uh, from the push forwards, they're at least for all intents and purposes, they're approximating a uniform distribution uh, to similar accuracy. But if you want the map to be invertible, you really need the monotonicity. So um, how do you do actually supervised learning with this? Once you have the map T, so once you do the training, the extraction of S is almost trivial. And then the way you do UQ is you generate a bunch of new reference samples from the marginal on from the reference marginal on Y, and then you just push the samples through S star evaluated at X star, and those new samples will be approximately distributed according to the conditional that you care about. All right, so uh, I'm just gonna take one more minute because I noticed I'm, I'm over time, just to show you this example. It's almost my last slide. Uh, so this is the MNIST data set, and uh, we want to do image in painting. So you have the digits and then you uh, corrupt them by basically taking a small box in the middle and removing those pixels. And then you want to reconstruct the digits again. So we train the whole MGAN on the MNIST training set. It has 5,000 images. So your input will be this corrupted image. Output would be reconstruction. And what I'm showing here, the first column are the input or the true images, second column are the corrupted images with the pixels removed. The next three columns are samples coming from the MGAN, so from our framework, um, which you can see like if I've taken nine and I block out a big part of it, it looks like either a seven or a nine. So you get two sevens and a nine. And then you can look at the mean of the image, which you can see the mean looks more like a seven on the top row. And then the variance, which is the most interesting part, you can see the variance is exactly in the part that sort of seven and nine digits will differ from each other. Another thing you can do is you can take these samples and you can push them through an independent classifier and you can say, okay, what is the probability of belonging to each digit? So in the first column, you see you're equally likely to be a nine or a seven, which is, which, you know, even a human would probably say this image is equally a nine or a seven. Some other interesting things happen, like you can take this two, but then this is with high probability a two, but it can also be a three or a seven. A seven because you can write the seven, you know, with, with seven with a little line across it. So it seems to capture sort of a lot of the natural uncertainty that you would expect from these kinds of uh, imaging problems. All right, so because I'm over time, I'm gonna skip the summary here and just uh, move directly to thanking you for, for your patience and, and listening for my talk. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Bamdad. So um, if there is any question, you can write it on the chat or maybe you can also uh, directly unmute yourself if you, if you wish. Um, let's see if there, Okay, for now, actually, I'll, I'll ask the first question, maybe. Mm -hmm. So actually it was, I quickly read in the, or in the slide you skipped. So maybe, so I was wondering, can you combine part two with part one in the sense like, can it be useful with conditional sampling in the parametric PDE setting? And if yes, how, what could be 
Yeah. So, so that was, I mean, you're a fast reader because I think I spent like half a second on this slide. So yeah, that's part of what we want to do is, is this sort of second point at the bottom. Um, so this would very nicely fit within the previous part of the talk that you take that neural network that we defined between the PCA spaces and you just replace it with this kind of triangular mapping. Um, in principle, I guess it, it should work, uh, but we just haven't tried it yet. So this, I mean, this stuff I'm presenting, we put out like a week ago, uh, but we, we have plans now to, to apply it in that setting to solve inverse problems. Uh, what we're mainly worried about is dimensionality. Um, so this example with the MNIST data is, I guess, sort of high dimensional. And the fact that this whole framework works in this case is encouraging. Uh, but we still don't know if you can sort of have convergence um, or good convergence for a PDE model in the sense that as you refine the mesh, your neural network doesn't blow up again. Um, because that seems to happen in the Hilbert space case anyways. You need more and more training data to approximate the mapping correctly. Uh, so that might be problematic. I don't know yet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, let's see if someone else has any question. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Let's see. Okay, so well, if there are no further questions, let's thank Bamdad again, and I invite you also to check out our next CRM Applied Math Seminar.